Yes, thanks. Thanks for the introduction. Welcome, everybody. I hope you are not too tired. Um, so yes, so I, I'll cover non-thermal messengers for the, from, from, from the universe in general. And uh, um, just as a preliminary remark on methodology, um, I might not be the best clear uh, blackboard writer, so especially to help those who are following remotely, I prepared some notes, uh, uh, hopefully with all the passages and so on. So that should be available after the lecture in the afternoon. Uh, so the, 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 my suggestion is that you focus on the concepts uh, rather than frantically taking notes. Uh, you will find hopefully all the content uh, in a more readable form. Uh, and um, uh, that's for the technical part. Uh, of course, there will be two exercise sessions tomorrow afternoon and on Thursday by Silvia Manconi. Um, and uh, uh, I looked at the program. You have a very dense uh, school program, so you won't have time for very deep uh, uh, conceptual problems. So the goal of the problems I've, I've suggested is really to consolidate the notions that I introduce. They should be rather straightforward, uh, just applying the, the formula and, and the concepts used. And I also um, uh, add some more advanced problems, uh, uh, or if you wish, reading suggestions for you after the school maybe to go back to some of these notions and, and uh, explore for, further uh, um, some of these uh, notions. Um, so the topic of the, of the course is non-thermal messenger. So the key word here is non-thermal, uh, which means that we will uh, deal with the evolution in space and in, uh, in, uh, in momentum, so in whole configuration space, um, of particles which do not interact fast enough, if you wish, to attain uh, Boltzmann or, or um, a Maxwell Boltzmann equilibrium or, you know, a Fermi Dirac or Bose Einstein uh, distribution for, for quantum uh, uh, particles. Um, and so the notions of thermodynamic equilibrium are not going to be applicable. And uh, uh, we will uh, rather um, um, investigate um, the evolution in non -thermal, uh, in a non thermal way. Uh, subject to collisionless and collisional type of processes. So these are the two big uh, type of processes we will focus on. Mostly collisionless one in the first part, so the first maybe three uh, lectures, and, and the collisional one in particular for the last uh, two. Um, in general, when I give this type of classes, I find a rather heterogeneous audience so just for a quick poll, at least for those following uh, here, how many of you have actually followed an astrophysics course in your studies? Okay, roughly what I have. And how many of you have followed a plasma physics course? Okay, so um, yeah, that, that's a very typical situation. So uh, some of you might find the first part boring. Uh, some of you might find too advanced, I don't know. Uh, um, so again, I will have to go a bit fast on some fundamental concepts that I introduce. In the notes, you find references also to hopefully introductory textbooks and reviews on some of the notions and more advanced ones if you uh, want to go uh, deeper. Um, and that's a typical problem in the, in the curriculum of many modern physics uh, courses there is less and less attention to advanced classical physics notions. And uh, this is unfortunately what you would need to, to, to go deeper in this, in this, uh, in this realm. So uh, um, a quick overview of the plan. Huh? So uh, today um, I will certainly cover what I would call a preliminary. Ah, this is not going to be very nice preliminary notions um, which are not directly related actually to, uh, uh, to um, non-thermal messengers but are some notions that I need you to, to grasp otherwise you will be uh, uh, sort of lost. Uh, then some uh, proper introduction which means 
some, some history, some basics, uh, things like that. Uh, and I will start covering probably this, uh, certainly this part two, uh, which uh, is about uh, co cosmic ray propagation. Perhaps again about nomenclature. Um, when I talk about non-thermal messengers, I will refer both to charged particles and neutral ones. Uh, but the charged particles are the, one, are the, the object of most of the, uh, the early lectures, at least, for the simple reason that uh, they are the ones uh, being accelerated and propagating non-trivially. Um, the neutral ones, photons and neutrinos, are typically byproducts of their interactions, and they are very, very useful for diagnostics, but we will cover um, some concepts later. Uh, so cosmic ray propagation, I was saying, um, there are some elementary considerations. And I would say something like heuristics. Uh, these are meant to convince you of some basic properties and then uh, we will um, deal with this problem in a more, let's say, first principle way. Uh, here is more or less where I expect the transition for today's lecture to, to end. Um, and then a, a third big chapter is cosmic ray acceleration mm? the basics what you need to, to actually uh, be able at all to accelerate uh, in astrophysical environment and then a little bit how do you describe it in terms of uh, equations um, the fourth is module is is basically collisions, mm? both leptonic and hadronic collisions. And uh, these are important, as I said, for, uh, because they are involved in the, in the production of these diagnostic tools like uh, gamma rays and neutrinos, but also because they alter uh, the chemical composition and the spectra of charged particles. So we, we need to cover them. Um, and then eventually, um, well, let's say multi-messenger aspects, gamma, neutrinos, uh, diffuse fluxes, and things like that. OK, that's the menu. Um, OK, in terms of units, I will be using natural units, mostly. I am anyway a, th a theoretical physicist by, by training, <laughs> which means Boltzmann constant equal to C equal to H bar equal to one. Uh, sometimes I will restate C for, uh, for, for clarity because we need to, to compare some velocities. So uh, I hope it's not confusing. I will keep, I, I'm not, a, I'm not doing gravitational physics, so I will keep, in general, G Newton uh, um, dimension full. Uh, this is also equal to 1 over Planck mass uh, square. Um, since we are doing some astrophysics, so um, there are also astrophysical units which will uh, pop up. Um, in the most frequently used uh, astrophysical units is certainly the ones concerning distances. Mm? These are um, related to the parsec, uh, kiloparsec, megaparsec, gigaparsec. Huh? Um, and roughly this is 3.23 uh, uh, light years, and these are essentially geometric units in, the, in, their, in their origin. It has to do with the parallax method to determine the distance of, to the stars. Huh? So this is the Earth in its orbit. That's a star. Uh, far away, uh, six months apart on the orbit around the sun, we will see these 
star position with respect to further stars move. Hmm? And basically, a parsec is the distance at which this angle is, is basically one arc second. Okay, so it's rough, slightly more than three light years, and these are multiples, uh, and I will give you shortly the link with the typical scales that we deal with in, uh, in astrophysics. Uh, another system of units that will uh, unavoidably appear um, are electromagnetic units, and in most of this literature, uh, Gaussian convention is used, uh, which means that uh, the four pi's are not in Coulomb and Biot-Savart law, uh, they are rather in Maxwell equations. Huh? Uh, hopefully this doesn't... I, I will stick to the convention that you will find in most of the textbooks and the review, that's why I use them, uh, which basically means that things like the, the magnetic energy density is, is B squared over 8 pi, uh, it's not B squared over 2 mu zero. Hmm? We will not use this one, but hopefully you will be able to convert them back and forth if you need. And I also provide you some basic conversions for natural units, so uh, magnetic fields, um, so magnetic fields intensity uh, as the units of an energy square, hmm? uh, because this is an energy density which has a unit of energy to the fourth. Huh? Um, and uh, the typical units in astrophysics for magnetic fields is the Gauss, and uh, actually micro Gauss for typical galactic values. Um, which is 10 to the minus 4 Tesla. Uh, um, if you are not familiar with natural units, there are a few exercises that won't be described tomorrow for you to get used to it, uh, uh, hopefully, but by now you have encountered them quite often, I hope. Um, in terms of scales, we will deal with uh, galactic and extragalactic environments. Okay? So for those of you who have astrophysical notions, that's trivial, but for those of you who have never uh, been exposed to them, um, be aware that both environments are extremely rarefied uh, as far as a comparison with, with terrestrial or even laboratory media uh, are concerned. When I say uh, extremely rarefied, I mean that, uh, uh, you know, typical density in, of matter in a galactic in environment, so in a galactic environment, a density, typical densities are typically below one particle per centimeter cube, maybe higher in the, towards the galactic center or um, in molecular clouds, a couple of orders of magnitude higher, uh, but these are extremely rarefied, huh? much better than the best vacuum you can get in a lab. Uh, and in the extragalactic environment, you may have densities which are even below 10 to the minus 6 particles per centimeter cube today. Huh? Um, in terms of uh, distances, typical galactic distances are, let's say, in the kiloparsec to 100 kiloparsec range. Hmm? Roughly, this is the size of the structure in the local spiral arms, and this is the size of a dark matter halo around a, a galaxy like, like ours, just to, to give you numbers. Um, a radi the radius of the Milky the visible disk of the Milky Way is roughly 15 kiloparsec, and the Sun is 8.3 kiloparsec away from the galactic center. Um, in terms of extragalactic scale, we are rather dealing with uh, larger than, say, 10 megaparsec. Huh? The closest galaxy, like Andromeda, is almost a, a megaparsec away. Close big galaxy, spiral galaxy outside uh, ours. And, uh, and, and you can get up to tens of, kilo, uh, of gigaparsec for cosmologically distant, but still causally connected um, uh, objects. So these are, these are the typical scales you deal with in the CMB. Huh? Um, in terms of time scales as well, uh, a revolution of the sun in the galaxy uh, takes about 240 million years. Hmm? This gives you an idea and uh, uh, a cosmological time scale is the age of the universe is almost for f 14 giga years. So you see that these are scales very extreme compared to what we have uh, in uh, uh, laboratory uh, experiments. Um, I won't use, think very much um, in the exercise, for instance, um, coordinate systems, I try to avoid 
uh, them, but for you to be aware if you, for instance, uh, uh, browse some catalogs of objects, uh, you should be at least aware that there are a couple of, uh, of reference systems that you will face. One is the equatorial, uh, which is the general purpose type of uh, 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 reference system that you find in astronomy. And this is nothing but the projection on the celestial sky, uh, 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 frame of the terrestrial uh, latitude and longitude system. Okay? So, uh, uh, this is the Earth, this is the equator. You can look at the same structure in the sky. You have a celestial equator, which is the projection of the terrestrial one into the sky. The only difference is that latitude, uh, the latitude is replaced by the, the, the declination. But that's the same criteria. Huh? You have a positive latitude, a positive declination above the equator, negative one below. And then the longitude in this frame is replaced by, by right ascension. Uh, here is a little bit trickier for the zero, uh, because on Earth the convention has varied over time, but it was usually uh, due to geopolitical reasons, right? It was El Hierro, uh, the zero latitude since uh, Ptolemy. Uh, later was Greenwich because of the uh, British power uh, over the seas. In, in, in space, uh, we use more uh, natural type of uh, uh, criteria for the zero. Basically, the zero is chosen um, as the intersection of the uh, equator with the ecliptic. Uh, the ecliptic is the apparent orbit of the sun around the Earth, if you wish, is the, the orbit of the Earth around the sun. And it's the vernal uh, equinox, about the two points where these intersect is the vernal one, the spring one, which is chosen as the zero latitude. Okay? This is, and usually you find these in degree and you find these in terms of equivalent uh, um, hours, minutes, and seconds. Okay? Uh, you divide uh, uh, the, 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 the 360 uh, degree in, 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 the, in uh, time equivalent, which is very practical because a distance of one hour in right ascension really means that basically your star takes one hour to cover that type of uh, uh, during the night. Huh? That's, that's the, the, and by the way, this is the reason why we still have the the division of the, the clock in multiples of 12 rather than, than, uh, than 10. Huh? Uh, it's related to the, to the angles. Um, besides this, this is a general purpose uh, uh, frame. The ones that are usually used in, in um, galactic astrophysics uh, uh, tend to um, uh, use the galactic plane as a reference huh? because you might want to see by eye if an object correlates with the galactic plane, the galactic center, or it's very far. Uh, off, so uh, uh, one, one, one coordinate system that you use is the galactic coordinate system, and this is centered uh, on the sun. Huh? So if we are here uh, in the sun, and this is the galactic center, um, basically you, you measure angles, which is the galactic latitude, as the angle between, it, it's indicated with B, huh? and it's the angle uh, above the, the, the direction connecting the sun to the galactic center po for positive latitudes and negative latitudes are below and, um, and you have then a, 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 um, a longitude and the longitude, okay, there is a, a, a little, di um, let me see, from the, from the bottom, if this is the sun, this is the galactic center, this is the solar position, uh, Basically, you have 90 degrees is here. This is instead a 270 degree in longitude. Mark, yes. Ah. Okay. Let me erase this. So this is the convention used. Okay. 90, 270. Uh, and this is the galactic center, sorry, C, okay, for the longitude. This is for the latitude. And then there is a galactocentric this, uh, system as well that is used sometimes. Um, this is a cylindrical coordinate system centered on the galactic center. Uh, what I mean is that now you have, uh, in the spiral arms, this is the galactic center, 
this is the sun. Mm? So uh, the coordinate r is the, the radial distance in the plane. Huh? Then you have a coordinate z, which is the height above or below the plane. And then you have a, a, another uh, uh, coordinate, the angular one, which is uh, usually, in, this is not universal, but usually is measured clockwise. Huh? Theta is measured clockwise from the with respect to the, the, the direction connecting the galactic center to the sun. Okay, all these are, are in the notes just for, for, for you to, to get familiar with those. If you, there are some exercises where I suggest you to go and look in some catalogs uh, and you might find some of these coordinates. I also give you a link with, uh, with a set of routines in Python. Uh, AstroPy is very used, so don't need to learn this by art, but at least to have an idea of what they are uh, uh, so that you are not lost. Um, in terms of um, content, uh, here I, I mentioned briefly the density of matter, uh, uh, but these, of the, the, these environments are also filled with, uh, with uh, magnetic fields and photon fields. Okay? So as far as we know, all environments where we have been able to measure sensitively enough we have found magnetic fields in astrophysics, basically. Um, and the typical, um, how, how do we diagnose them? Uh, by techniques like Faraday rotation, or uh, you have synchrotron radiation, and you have uh, 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 polarized light emission, uh, Zeeman splitting for, for more intense fields. So if you are not familiar with those, uh, I suggest you to, to go to general purpose type of reference, like uh, if, if you are really curious, huh? you won't, won't need that to understand what I'm going to say, but if you are curious, uh, books like, uh, I find particularly useful, for instance, books like uh, Kip Thorns and Roger Blanford, uh, Modern Classical Physics, there you find a quite accessible general introduction. Um, just to give you an idea in terms of magnetic fields, Uh, in the galaxy, you get magnetic fields which are few microgauss in intensity. This can be uh, lower for the regular component of the field. The regular component of the field more or less follows the spiral arms in the disk. Huh? Um, it's much more uncertain what happens at high latitude. Uh, there might be a fountain toward the inner galaxy and so on. And uh, it's larger, uh, and, and you have a comparable, if not larger, uh, turbulent field. So it's a small scale, more incoherent type of field. And in terms of extragalactic fields, um, uh, well, we have detected similar intensity, maybe a slightly lower micro Gauss intensity field in clusters of galaxies. Um, for the really extragalactic space, or should I say uh, intergalactic space, there are indirect observations that suggest that there is a, there is a magnetization. Uh, the lower limit is very weak. Uh, we are more or less sure that it should be above 10 to the minus 19, 18 Gauss, which is a very loose lower limit. We have more or less ro robust upper limit at the nano Gauss uh, scale for megaparsec coherence length. What exactly is the field, we don't know. We suspect, based on simulation, that it should be correlated with the filaments and large-scale structure connecting, uh, you know, over densities. But we don't know. Probably even the vacuum, uh, the, 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 the almost vacuum uh, volumes, the voids, uh, uh, should be magnetized. But we don't know exactly how, how strongly. Um, and uh, and uh, concerning photon fields. Sorry if I do some zoology, but uh, I want things to be more or less clear. So the photon fields on the extragalactic uh, level, they are dominated by the CMB. Mm? So in the extragalactic, the CMB, which is a black body spectrum with a temperature of 2.7 Kelvin, mm? The energy density today of roughly 0.3 electron volt per centimeter cube, to give you an idea. Um, this is in the microwaves. Huh? Uh, but there is also another background which is of interest, and it's often denoted as EBL, 
let me put it here, EBL, extragalactic background light. Huh? Now, this is way less um, dense in terms of energy, a couple of orders of magnitude than the, um, uh, in terms of particle, sorry, particle density is way less uh, important than the, than the CMB. It's less than one order of magnitude, actually lower even in energy density, uh, but it's important because this falls in the ultraviolet, optical, and infrared range, huh, as opposed to the, to, the, to the microwaves here. Um, the scaling with redshift, CMB scales as one plus Z cube for the number density of particles, as one plus Z to the fourth for the energy density. Uh, this is less um, uh, trivial because this EBL, where it comes from? It, it comes from the, the starlight, first of all. Huh? Stellar objects everywhere in the universe, they, they, they shine and they emit ultraviolet, optical, and near-infrared photons, and eventually there is a background due to all that, but there is also some reprocessing coming from absorption from dust grains. The universe is dusty, if you ever never heard about that, but you should take into account, especially if you do CMB uh, physics. Um, and they, they re-emit uh, typically in the longer wavelength, huh? so infrared and far infrared. Um, in the galactic case, in the galactic case, of course you always have the CMB, but it's usually less important for dynamical considerations unless you go to high energies like PEV energies. Uh, in the galactic case, you have also a, a, a UV uh, uh, optical and, and infrared background, uh, which is slightly less, uh, more dense in terms of energy density. It's, it's at the level of, you know, electron volt per centimeter cube. And this, this is contributed, of course, by all stellar objects and the dust in the galaxy. Huh? Um, and the difference is that while these are basically isotropic, this is not. So the density of these guys is peaking towards the inner galaxy. Okay? So if you do calculation of absorption, uh, you should take th that into account. And I, I, in the notes, you will find some plots uh, to give you an idea of this, uh, how they look like in terms of wavelength uh, spectra. Um, a fact that, you know, might have a dynamical uh, explanation, but there is no consensual uh, explanation yet, uh, at least in the details, is the fact that in the galactic environment, the energy density in uh, starlight, in, um, in uh, magnetic fields, and in cosmic rays are roughly equal. Hmm? They are, this is sometimes called a manifestation of the equi equipartition, it's of the order of fractions of electron volt per centimeter cube. Huh? That might be related to, to coupling uh, between these things, but uh, there are also people that believe this is just a coincidence and uh, uh, it has not, no, no deep reason. Okay. I, I just mention you because you might find this expression in some, some textbooks. Okay, so, uh, so far so good for things which are nothing to do especially with, with cosmic rays, but there are some notions that I really need you to, to, to have heard at least once uh, uh, in order to understand what I'm going to say. Um, uh, let me start now the cosmic ray part with, with, uh, with some history. Mm -hmm. So um, I won't do a, an historical review, but you must be familiar about some uh, dates and even some concepts, <coughs> including the name, the origin of the name. Uh, I don't know, but wh when I, I, I started learning about cosmic rays, I was wondering, why the hell are they called rays, right? These are mostly charged particles, and still they are called cosmic rays. Why, why this so? Uh, and this has a historical origin, in fact. So um, the, the, the first phenomena that are um, attributed to what we call today cosmic rays uh, go back at least to the, to the 18th century. Huh? For instance, Charles Coulomb was, was experiencing some unexplained discharge of uh, um, electroscopes that were, as long as he could say, uh, isolated. Mm? Uh, we, know, uh, we now know that uh, cosmic rays contribute a lot to this uh, discharge phenomena. Um, the first theories related to this phenomena appeared at the turning of the uh, 19th to 20th century when people discover radioactivity. Uh, so there were speculations that this discharge phenomena could be related to a spontaneous 
emission from, from the ground, of radioactive material from the ground that would discharge them. And the first pioneering experiences in cosmic rays uh, uh, were, were done around uh, 1911, 1912 by people like uh, uh, Pacini, uh, S. Uh. So uh, uh, these people looked, in, in particular Pacini looked at how this ionization rate changed when he performed experiences uh, um, underground, uh, sorry, underwater uh, in, the, in the Gulf of Genoa. Uh, and he found that they were declining when he went down rather than going up. If it's coming from the ground, you should go up when, when you go deep. Uh, uh, S did the opposite. He took a balloon and was measuring how it changes when you go up. And he found that instead of decreasing, it went up. Okay, he was lucky because eventually you would find a decrease if you go up enough. But uh, these experience, experiments convinced people that this phenomenon is astrophysical. It's not geophysical. Uh, so you have to find an explanation in, in, in astrophysics. Uh, Hess also um, tested if he could find a correlation with the, with the presence of the sun in the sky or not, at night or day, and he didn't find any significant variation. So uh, he concluded that this is a phenomenon that comes from outside the solar system. It's not a local astrophysical phenomenon. Now we know that it's more complicated. Even the sun can produce solar flares and accelerate low energy cosmic rays. But yeah, the, the basic picture is correct. Um, the, the name, according to the name, so there were two basic theories in the, you know, the 20s or so uh, uh, about the cosmic rays. One was the main proponent was Millikan the one that you have probably heard in particle physics uh, uh, studies, he told that these were essentially gamma rays, photons, the cry of the birth of the elements. That's how they, he thought of, of these gamma rays. So gamma rays associated to the production of the elements, where elements were produced, and if this was a real serious problem, scientific problem at the time was disputed, according to some, this was an initial condition, meaningless to think about where elements originate. Uh, he was of a different advice. So he called them cosmic rays. Uh, the opponent, the main opponent was Compton, that you might have also heard about, uh, uh, hopefully. Uh, and he thought they were charged particles. Uh, this big debate was settled in favor of Compton, but the name cosmic rays remained. So Millikan got a, a saying about the name. Um, and uh, the same has happened in cosmology, uh, you might know, that Big Bang actually was a, 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 a name used by oil to ridiculize you know, uh, the, 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 this idea that the universe is dynamical. It has been proven right, but the name has uh, stayed. Uh, and the same happened in cosmic rays. How do they prove that? Huh? How could they infer that they are charged particles? Essentially because of uh, the, early, in the early times, in the late 20s and 30s in particular, it was the latitude effect. So people started uh, campaigns uh, all over the world, um, um, espe especially by European uh, uh, physicists, uh, taking profit of the fact that this was the end of the colonial period. So there were colonies scattered a little bit everywhere. Uh, so they, they ran campaigns of measurements of cosmic rays at different uh, latitudes. And they found systematically that there is an increase of the cosmic ray intensity when you go to high geomagnetic latitude. So there is an exercise, very simple, you can do it more elaborately or in a very one-line type of calculation uh, that I propose that you will discuss tomorrow that, uh, that explains why it is so. Mm? And uh, uh, there were also other studies, so people involved in these experiments, for instance, you might have heard about, uh, especially for the Italian students, you might have heard about Rossi. Huh? Rossi was one uh, uh, astrophysicist that pioneered these studies. In particular, there was some campaign in Eritrea. Other physicists went to, to the Svalbard uh, uh, and measured there. So, and, you, and there was a compilation. There is still a nice review, by the way, uh, by, um, by, by Compton. Uh, you can find on physics review uh, if you are interested to, on these historical aspects. Um, yeah, 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 it's from here. That's why I mentioned uh, uh, you might heard um, about these campaigns. Um, and, uh, and by the way, he also wrote a review uh, on uh, showers. We will talk shortly about that, uh, that you might find uh, very pedagogical, actually. It's a very nice introduction to this topic, um, roughly in the same period. Uh, the fact that there were 
predominantly uh, uh, positively charged was discovered because there is an asymmetry between east and west. Uh, if you look at the uh, rate of arrival from the east and from the west, you find an asymmetry, and this is consistent with a mostly positively charged uh, um, nature. Mm? Um, and in this period, let's say from the 30s to the early 50s, this is really the golden period for cosmic ray research. Uh, also for fundamental physics. Okay? So you might have heard about the discovery of the positron, and the discovery of the muon, and the discovery of the pion, uh, and also strange particles, kaons, uh, and uh, sigma, and lambda, and so on. All these were discovered with cosmic rays. There were basically no accelerators at the time. So particle physics was essentially using this natural beam and studying the byproducts of this in the atmosphere. Mm? Uh, this peer, and there were many Nobel Prizes awarded, you know, Anderson, Hess, uh, etc., etc. Um, Auger and uh, uh, Rossi uh, pioneered the, the, the use of, uh, um, you know, coincident detectors to study extensive air showers. Uh, these are in used when cosmic rays interact in the upper atmosphere, and there are multiplicative processes. We will uh, discuss shortly a, a, a toy model of that. Uh, and this allowed what is today known as indirect detection technique for cosmic rays. Um, this, this sort of uh, uh, golden age uh, of um, twin de uh, development of cosmic rays and particle physics ended sort of at the, um, if you want a date, is 1953. There was a cosmic ray conference uh, in the Bannière de Bigor in, in France uh, where more or less the two communities got split and uh, particle physicists started uh, you know, building accelerators and studying uh, uh, controlled uh, condition uh, productions and cosmic ray physicists basically devoted more on to the astrophysics uh, uh, of it. It doesn't mean that the, the, the same person could not be interested in both topics. One great example is Fermi. Uh, just after uh, World War II uh, uh, and the development of nuclear power and the Manhattan Project and so on, he wrote the first paper proposing more or less a, 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 a meaningful explanation for the acceleration of cosmic ray. It's the process that is today known as second order Fermi acceleration. Um, so some people worked on both, but it's fair to say that the methods sort of decoupled. And this situation has, I mean, I don't want to be too sharp, but has sort of started to reverse in the 80s uh, when people started to think again of cosmic messengers as a way to probe um, uh, fundamental physics. Uh, this has to do with research like uh, indirect searches and uh, even direct searches of dark matter. Uh, and uh, uh, you might be familiar with the neutrino oscillations, atmospheric neutrinos. They require knowledge of uh, uh, cosmic ray physics. Um, and then there have been many discoveries in what is now known the multi-messenger uh, approach. For instance, the, over the last decade, you might have heard about the discovery of a diffuse astrophysical neutrino flux uh, by Ice Cube, and we will mention that uh, at the end of the lectures. Okay? So this is for a short historical overview. Let me go a little bit ahead uh, before stopping. Um, um, what, about, what about some phenomenological aspects concerning cosmic rays? Namely, uh, how do they look like in, in energy space? Huh? If you look at the flux of cosmic rays as a function of energy, this flux looks like, uh, I mean, varies by roughly 10 orders of magnitude or more over range of energies where we have detected them from, uh, from let's say, GV energies up to 10 to the 20 electron volt or so. And this is roughly above a few GV. This is looking like a power law. I'm oversimplified it in the sense that it's not always having the same spectral index. There are tiny variations of the spectral index. Um, but the key thing I want to uh, uh, mention is the fact that Basically, the fluxes here are of the order of one particle per centimeter square per second, which means these are very frequent events. Uh, and these are the type of events you might worry about if you do accelerator physics or uh, dark matter uh, direct detection or so. You want to be shielded by the bulk of these events. Um, if you go to tens or hundred uh, TV, uh, uh, the typical flux is, uh, is at the level of a particle per day per meter square. And this is sort of the limiting 
size of experiments that you can fly uh, above the atmosphere or at the top of the atmosphere or you can uh, dock to the International Space Station or put on a satellite. Um, and beyond that, you have fluxes as low as one particle per kilometer square per century. And clearly, this realm is only possible to probe in an in indirect way. Uh, this is really possible to probe in a direct way. Uh, and by direct, I mean that here you can really identify particle by particle uh, what this particle is. And basically, you fly particle physics detectors on uh, balloons, on uh, satellites, and uh, with spectrometers, calorimeters, Cherenkov detectors, you measure the, the, the charge, the mass, the, the velocity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, example of these are, I don't know, Fermilat for gamma ray uh, astrophysics, or uh, which is on a satellite, or uh, AMS uh, O2, which is doc it's a cosmic charge, cosmic rays, predominantly detector docked on the International Space Station. Uh, there are peculiarities. I don't want to oversimplify the problem compared to the typical experimental problems that you find in, uh, in, um, in accelerators. Uh, of course, you cannot go there and uh, study very precisely your alignment, so you have to de devise indirect techniques to, to align your, uh, your uh, detector for spectrometric uh, type of considerations. Uh, the background is very different for Fermi. Think of Fermi, uh, you know, this is a gamma ray telescope, but most of the background that you have uh, is hadronic in nature, in fact. Uh, um, this is maybe very different in a collider where you might have many more electromagnetically interacting particles than hadronically interacting particles. But uh, uh, morally speaking, we are talking about particle physics experiment uh, uh, in the sky. Uh, for indirect techniques, the situation is different. What do I mean by indirect technique? What I mean by indirect technique is that, let me draw with my limited capabilities some, some little uh, cartoon. By indirect technique, I mean that you do not study the, the particle that is coming from outer space directly. Huh? You study the byproducts of the particle interaction in the atmosphere. So there is a very simple model due to Eitler that roughly uh, works uh, uh, um, for electromagnetically induced shower in a reasonable way. So the idea, for instance, imagine you have a photon. Huh? Uh, impinging for simplicity vertically here uh, on the atmosphere. Uh, after a characteristic length, uh, uh, let's call it lambda, this lambda depends on, the, on, the, on particle physics and the environmental conditions of the atmosphere, the composition, the density, etc. Um, uh, uh, um, lambda, uh, actually, the typical variable used here is, is, is called grammage, uh, and this is uh, the, the integral over the path length of your, of your particle of the density encountered, okay? So this is measured in, uh, uh, this is measured in grams over centimeter square, typically. Hmm? So after crossing some material, your photon can pair produce, so it will produce E plus E minus. The e plus E minus, eventually after a, a distance which is comparable, huh, it can, uh, uh, radiate a, a, a photon, and so you have another multiplication of particles, and so on and so forth. Huh? This is um, um, the type of process, multiplicative process that you have. Huh? Eventually, the number of particles grows, and the average energy per particle declines. And this goes on until the average energy drops below a critical energy, which is an energy, depending only on, uh, on particle uh, uh, and nuclear physics, basically, this energy is the energy uh, below which uh, energy losses proceed essentially through ionization, uh, not by multiplicative processes, okay? Um, so this does not depend on, uh, you can measure it if you, you can even compute it for QED. Uh, but uh, but that's, that's, that's the idea of this Eitler model. Um, and uh, uh, before going into the little math, concerning this Eitler model, um, indirect techniques means that you have access to either observables like uh, the, the number of particles as a function of the depth in the atmosphere. Um, this is usually 
um, computed in terms of the grammage crossed. Let me, let me draw it like that. You can think of the number of particles. Um, this is the number of particles. Once you go through in the atmosphere, the number of particles grows and eventually declines huh? because you, you run below this condition. And uh, um, there are observables which are sensitive to this uh, shower development uh, quantity. Uh, examples are the scintillation light uh, that these particles induce when they collide with the uh, molecules in the atmosphere or um, the Cherenkov radiation. Mm. So, uh, for instance, the, the, the fluorescence telescopes in the Auger Observatory or Telescope Array Observatory measure this type of um, uh, profile development, shower development observable. Imaging air Cherenkov telescopes uh, measure the Cherenkov light, but the idea is that they are sensitive to the development of this. Mm. And then through, um, through stereoscopic view, uh, uh, if you look at the, the profile development um, uh, from different direction, you can not only reconstruct the, the, the projected direction, but really the 3D uh, direction of arrival. So these are ways also to determine where your initial primary particles come from. Um, and then there are other experiments, which are also indirect experiments, which are basically uh, measuring a slice uh, of this thing at a given uh, depth in the atmosphere. Uh, because they are on ground, uh, they are like muon uh, tanks or scintillators, and so even measuring a slice and measuring some timing of arrival, you can reconstruct the shock. Uh, the shock. You can reconstruct the front of these particles, and so try to, to, to reconstruct the arrival direction. And also, since you know the, the, the direction and you know the, the age of the shower, I, I, how is it called? Uh, uh, so at which point, if you wish, in this curve, the thing is located, you can try to reconstruct other properties of the, the shower. So this is the logic. Now I show you in a simple model, five minutes, uh, how this works to give you an idea. Uh, don't take them too uh, seriously in a quantitative uh, meaning, because now these things are done with, via simulation tools. Hmm? But at least you have an idea. Um, the, the, the first thing that you might notice in this simple model let's put it there, is that the, the, if, you have a particle, if you have a particle with an initial energy E0. Sorry. Yes. Two things. First of all, what, we, what is the label of the y-axis? This is, for instance, the number of particles. Okay. Uh, uh, Sorry, so the y, yeah. The, no, no, the number of, the x-axis is the number of particles. The y-axis is x. Is the, is, the depth, is the depth in the atmosphere. You can think, if for a vertical shower, it would be just the height above the ground. For an inclined shower, you have really a, a, a conversion factor. In the case where the, uni the atmosphere is uh, uniform, you have a constant density, then you can use them interchangeably. Okay? But otherwise, you have to use a model of atmosphere and convert height into a variable x. So you can think of it, this is x or some proxy of it, okay? So, yes, I, I, I'll try to explain here, maybe in a better way, it's more obvious. So, you have an initial energy E0 for, say, your photon that is impinging, okay? After a single pair production, you have that the, the energy is E0 over 2. If for each electron and positron. After n steps in this cascade, the average energy is E naught over 2 to the n for each particle. Okay? And this corresponds to a depth, huh? a grammage crossed, which is n times your lambda. So in that picture, you see that each step takes the same lambda. But doesn't mean that the same lambda corresponds to the same uh, uh, geometric uh, uh, distance in the atmosphere, because the atmosphere is not a, a uniform uh, density. Okay? It's uniform in that variable, in that grammage variable. Hmm? Um, so you have a maximum number of particles in this multiplicative process when, when uh, basically 
your photon or electron prefer to lose energy in non-multiplicative type of process. For instance, ionization. Okay? And this is something I have some value. It's roughly 80 MeV hmm, in the atmosphere, this, this, this e EC. So uh, it's roughly 80 MeV. And just to give you an idea, the lambda for a photon is roughly 35 grams per centimeter, over centimeter square. I don't know if this talks to you, but these are things that you can measure, you find in the particle data book, etc. Not very conceptually deep. And uh, 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 one thing that is important is that eventually, once this average energy drops below that, the number of particles that you have reaches its maximum. Huh? So this is nothing but E0 over E critical. So if you measure the maximum number of particles in your shower development, since you know that the lab, you can infer what's the energy of the impinging particle in this simple model. When does it happen? It happens at the depth x max, which is uh, lambda times the log base 2 of E over uh, E naught over EC because of this multiplicative. So take, take, take the, uh, it's equivalent to this type of relation. Okay? Now, um, equivalently, since, since you know this constant, you know this constant, if you determine the x max, you can determine the energy of your shower. So this is one way you can have access to the energy information from this type of indirect uh, detection. Before taking a, a short break, what changes if you have an hadronic shower? If you have a, cosmic, a charged cosmic ray that, that interacts, say a proton or a nucleus? Huh? Uh, this model doesn't work so well quantitatively anymore, uh, but the basic idea is still correct. So you can model um, uh, roughly the hadronic interaction. We will come back to these collisional effects, but you can model the hadronic interaction as producing uh, some number of pions, hmm? in general, hadronic interacting particles. Uh, at each interaction, you have some multiplicity, new plus, new minus of, of uh, pions that you produce. And uh, um, uh, what happens is that in the high energy collisions, uh, you have an isospin symmetry. So the number of pi plus, pi minus, and pi zero that you produce is roughly equal. Huh? So one third of the energy on average at each collision stage is going into pi zeros, and two thirds into charged particles, huh? charged pions. So the part of um, uh, energy in the, and this repeats. Now once you go into a, a pi zeros, pi zeros decays into gamma gamma, so they initiate a, an electromagnetic subshower the hadronic part can keep interacting, okay? So at each stage in your uh, cascade development, what happens is that uh, you only retain an hadronic fraction of your energy, which is two thirds of E naught, and an electromagnetic, which is one third of E naught. This is the first stage, huh? but at following stages, at following stages, you have an hadronic interaction which is eventually two thirds to the power of n of E naught, and an electromagnetic interaction energy, which is one minus two thirds to the n of E naught. So your shower becomes more and more electromagnetically uh, rich uh, uh, because you are draining into electromagnetic particles and uh, you get less and less infraction of, of uh, uh, pions. Okay, so <coughs> the number, sorry, the average energy of your charged particles, your charged pions, let's denote it by E plus, E minus, hmm, uh, is going to be E naught divided by basically three half of nu plus minus to the power of n. This is the multiplicity of charged particles. Three half of it is the total multiplicity to the power of n is the total number of particles after n stages. So this is the, 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 the typical average uh, uh, energies. And uh, um, uh, eventually what happens again, the pions, there is a critical energy uh, below which a pion rather decays into a muon, 
rather than uh, um, undergoing multiplicative hadronic interaction. Okay? So the maximum is reached when this average energy uh, uh, again be be becomes of the order of this uh, decaying critical energy. And uh, uh, you deduce that n max plus minus is equal to uh, uh, basically log e0 over ed. This is exactly the same relation apart from this scaling factor that we had before. Okay. Why this is important? Because for each charged particle, for each charged pion, you have eventually a muon coming from the decay of the uh, pion, and you can observe the muon. The muon is a very penetrating particle, typically doesn't, doesn't interact much, huh? and this is something you can measure on the ground. And uh, the number of muons is nothing but basically the number of pi plus, pi minuses, which is in turn the multiplicity of pi minus, pi plus per uh, interaction raised to the power of this n plus and minus max, huh? this one, which means that the log of n muons is given by uh, n plus minus max times log of nu plus minus, which is in turn something like beta log e naught over e d. Okay, and this beta coefficient is nothing but the log of nu plus nu minus over the log of three halves nu plus nu minus. This multiplicity, I don't remember exactly the value, but it's of the order of six or seven, something like that. So this beta is roughly 0.85. So this is just to say you that you can also measure the energy in principle by measuring how many muons you get on the ground. Mm? This is something new. You don't have this in the electromagnetic shower. Um, also, imagine that instead, and, and then we take a break. <laughs> uh, 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 imagine that you, or uh, up to you, I don't know, we can even end a little bit earlier, uh, up to you, uh, depending on how tired you are. Um, basically, the, if you take a superposition model and you say that the nucleus is just A nucleons, mm, the, the energy available is the same. Let's make this hypothesis. So the total number of particles available is going to be the same hmm, at the max. This is nothing but E naught over E uh, C or E D, whatever, hmm, this critical energy. However, um, since you have now N particles, they will interact earlier. Hmm? So in our, in our picture, the cross-section of a nucleus with, the, with, the, with the atmospheric material is larger, huh? which means that if you have a proton doing that, a nucleus typically will do, do that. Huh? So although the energy available is the same, the depth will be uh, shorter at which you reach your maximum. Huh? And, and uh, in fact, it's, it, it's trivial to show that the maximum for a nucleus, huh, A, is going to be X proton uh, max, sorry, x max proton minus lambda of a proton times the log of A. So this is just to say that if you measure now the, both the total energy through, through the number of particles produced in the shower and the depth at which this maximum happens, you can try to infer the chemical composition of your, of your shower. Okay? So you have the same number of particles for a nucleus, but the, the distribution of development is, is, is narrowed. Huh? And you can also prove that the variance of this part, this is a stochastic uh, variable, the variance also is smaller for a nucleus than for a proton. Okay? And, um, and that's it. So uh, let's stop here. There is an exercise just to consolidate these notions, so tomorrow you will see more uh, some quantitative details of that. Uh, let me just conclude about the fact that this model, this generalized um, uh, Eitler model, is not actually very good at quantitative prediction, this one for hadronic uh, interactions. And in fact, um, now we rely on, uh, on extensive air shower simulators. Unfortunately, there are hadronic uh, uh, uncertainties associated with that, uh, because these type of processes are non-perturbative QCD processes. These are what are called forward physics 
uh, processes in collider jargon. We will come back to that. Um, and, uh, and basically, uh, there are two difficulties. One is that we don't have a, a first principle theory for those. And second difficulty is that for the highest energy showers, uh, we are even above the energies probed by LHC. So we don't even have data uh, to calibrate to. Uh, so um, that's why measurements of, say, chemical composition in uh, ultra energy cosmic ray experiments are very hard. Okay? We have a very loose idea if there is a trend of dominating protons rather than dominating ions, uh, and so on and so forth. So let's stop maybe 10 minutes and then we have an half, half an hour to conclude. Okay? <laughs> Maybe before we start, I just want to answer collectively to a question that was raised. Why did I insist on the fact that these are non-thermal messengers? Okay, one way to realize why why these are non-thermal messengers is the plot I, I made before, right? The flux versus energy. These flux here, this is a power law type of flux. It's very far from a Maxwell-Boltzmann type of uh, distribution. Okay, so clearly these objects are not energized in a thermal environment where you, I don't know, heat up some astrophysical objects up to PV or uh, even TV or GEV. That's not how it works. So it's a, it's a physics question. How do you accelerate these particles up to these high energies? Why do, do they have this shape in energy space? And that's exactly what happens also on Earth, right? If you want to study high energy physics, you do not heat up a medium up to TV energies. That's not a very efficient way, not only the fact that we don't know how to do it, but that's not really how do you do it. Uh, and actually, there are experiments trying to do high energy uh, collisions of nuclei, try to produce uh, things like a quark gluon plasma, etc. So that's not the, the way we accelerate protons up to TV in a collider on Earth, and that's clearly not the way nature accelerates these particles. So we have to study the, the tools through which this can happen. Okay, that was just a comment. Let me, um, if it was not clear to, to, to some of you. So uh, another point I want to mention uh, is the chemical, the chemical uh, composition. Okay, what are these fluxes made of? So they are made mostly of protons, actually. Uh, with, um, tra well, traces. There is a sizable fraction of helium nuclei, of course, these are fully ionized, given the energies. Uh, and actually, all nuclei, uh, all, at least all stable nuclei of the periodic table, as far as I know, have been detected in, ultra, in, in cosmic rays, although nuclei beyond iron are way less abundant. Okay? And uh, um, there are also electrons uh, uh, at level of percentage of the protons, and you will understand why it is so. It should be so. Um, and uh, because naively you would expect, since the universe is neutral, right? Uh, do you have as many uh, uh, electrons, roughly, as protons, huh? assuming that the hydrogen dominates? How is it that the flux of electrons and the flux of protons are not comparable? Huh? This is a puzzle, a physics uh, question. Whatever the mechanism for acceleration is, um, and then there are nuclei up to at least iron. Roughly, the abundances of these species. So, how many? I don't know, carbons per oxygen, etc. They roughly match what we measure, say, in the solar system. You might have seen this nice picture of the astronauts on the moon uh, uh, deploying these sort of uh, nets uh, uh, on the surface of the moon, and they were trying to collect dust. Uh, um, now, this is done with micrometeorites, etc., etc. One of the purposes of these experiments is to know the chemical composition of the material in the solar system. But uh, for cosmic rays, roughly they match. Uh, there are a few uh, notable differences. One notable difference is that uh, uh, elements like lithium, beryllium, boron are overrepresented in cosmic rays with respect to what we know in the solar system. Sorry. These are very rare elements in the solar system and in most thermal astrophysical environments, and we think we understand why, because these type of elements have a very low binding energy per nucleon. So they are fragile. Fragile in a thermonuclear sense. 
It means that once they are uh, present in hot environments like stars, they tend to be burned out very efficiently. Okay? So they are, their abundance is almost zero huh, for, for what matters, for, for instance, for us, for the injection of cosmic rays. Um, but they are present in cosmic rays and they are, you know, maybe at the level of 10% to 30% of the uh, more abundant nuclei like uh, uh, carbon, oxygen, etc. Hmm? And the reason this is interpreted as the result of, you know, spallation. So these nuclei in cosmic rays, differently from solar system material, these have energies of GeV, TeV, and, and above. Uh, so once they hit uh, interstellar material, they can uh, uh, spallate, they can lose some nucleons in the collision and produce these lighter elements. That's the, the way this overabundance is interpreted. It's interpreted as the result of the grammage that these primary cosmic rays experience in the interstellar medium. Huh? So there is another exercise uh, for tomorrow where just using this fact, uh, you can infer that cosmic rays cannot propagate in straight line in the galaxy. Otherwise, the, the, these observable would be badly uh, uh, predicted. Okay, and then we will come back to this problem once we have the full uh, propagation machinery to compute more from first principle what you should expect for that in a simple geometry. But already that, without knowing much, tells you that they cannot propagate in straight lines. Okay, uh, and the same is true for what is called sub-iron uh, with respect to iron and also for some uh, isotopic uh, species like deuterium and uh, helium-3. Huh? They are overabundant with respect to what we find in the solar system by, by like some four orders of magnitude or so. So um, I won't talk about isotopic studies in cosmic rays, but if you find them, don't be surprised about that. Um, okay, um, final uh, notational aspect before mentioning something about heuristics on cosmic ray propagation is about units. Uh, fluxes of cosmic rays are typically um, either plotted or measured versus energy. Usually this is done when you want to focus on particle physics processes that can be induced by these cosmic rays. Energy is a meaningful variable. Alternatively, you can use momentum. Huh? Plot fluxes with momentum. This is usually done in theoretical, for theoretical studies because this is the natural variable in phase space you want to use. Uh, they can be done also in terms of energy per nucleon, if they are nuclear species. The reason why this is used, uh, and sometimes also kinetic energy per nucleon or so, this is done because in spallation processes, the one producing these guys, we will come back to that, but the ones producing these, these guys, roughly the energy per nucleon is conserved. So it makes sense if you want to compare, you know, uh, spallated objects. And also rigidity, this is another variable which is extremely used. So rigidity, is nothing but momentum over, over the, the, the charge, okay? Z is the uh, atomic uh, number, E is the elementary positron charge. So it's momentum over charge, and we will see uh, in a second that this is the key variable if you want to focus on propagation aspects of cosmic rays in magnetic fields, because cosmic rays having the same rigidity uh, um, have the same trajectory uh, in a given magnetic field, okay? So these are the typical quantities used. If you want, you can train yourself to convert these simple uh, kinematical variables one into another. So you can compute the Jacobian of transformation of these if you want to convert the flux in one in the flux of the other. Of course, there are codes that can do that for you. But you know, if you do, there are papers, even famous papers, where there are mistakes on these things. So uh, the trivial things are the ones where people get confused uh, uh, the most, I think. Um, anyway, um, what I want to focus on now is actually some notions of uh, propagation of cosmic rays. Hmm? So let me introduce this, uh, this, this notion of propagation of cosmic rays. Um, hopefully you know how a charged particle propagates in a magnetic field, constant magnetic field. Huh? Just as a reminder, uh, the, the equation of motion is it's rather trivial, you have just the Lorentz force. Huh? So let's start by this, uh, with this simple problem. B0 is this constant magnetic field that I will assume oriented along the z direction. Hmm? 
in this type of uh, equation of motion, you have that uh, V is conserved, uh, P, which is M gamma V, is also conserved. Huh? Uh, and then you have that uh, Vz, the projection of the velocity along the direction of the magnetic field is also conserved. Uh, and as a consequence, even V orthogonal, which is the, the orthogonal component, is also conserved. Uh, mu, which is nothing but the, the ratio of Pz over P or Vz over V, is also conserved because these ones are each conserved. And as a consequence, also P orthogonal, which is square root 1 minus mu square of P, is also conserved. Okay? Uh, in terms of motion, you know that this type of uh, equation of motion will describe an helicoidal motion around your constant magnetic field, which means that in the direction orthogonal to the magnetic field, you have a circular movement, huh? circular uniform motion, uh, dv orthogonal over dt uh, is qv orthogonal b0 over uh, m gamma. Huh? This must be equal dv gamma over dt must be uh, equal also to v square orthogonal over r. Huh? This is a centripetal uh, acceleration. So you have a radius of your circular motion in the xy direction, which is uh, m gamma v orthogonal over q b0. OK? So in the non-relativistic case, that's the only non-trivial part that maybe you have uh, not in mind. In the non-relativistic case, you can define a, 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 a phase frequency uh, of gyration, which is qb0 over uh, m, and associate to that a radius of gyration, or gyro radius, which is v orthogonal over uh, omega g. Hmm? In the relativistic case, uh, you have what is called the Larmor radius, which is nothing but gamma rg. And you have associated uh, uh, angular frequency, capital omega, which is omega gyration over gamma. Uh, and these frequencies are very, uh, this time scale, or 1 over omega is a very fast time scale for astrophysical purposes. For GeV energies and charge 1 is at the level of maybe 100 seconds or so, or 100 inverse seconds for omega. So these are very short time scale compared to the millions of years of what that I mentioned before. Um, the, the, okay, the equation of motion, of course, here you can integrate them. Okay? X of t will be given by some initial condition, xg plus r with some choice of phase, you can always write them like that. Omega t, y of t is equal to yg plus, or maybe let's say, minus rl cosinus omega t, and z of t is some zg uh, plus vz times uh, t, uh, which you can also write zg uh, plus v mu t. Mm? So these are just describing this type of motion. Mm? Okay? And a, a, a movement with, there is one fictitious particle of coordinates x, g, y, g, z of t. Mm? This is called guiding center, and this is the particle that moves uniformly along the magnetic field. Okay? So you can describe the movement of cosmic ray like a, a, a circular movement around this um, guiding center. Um, now, if I modify this picture and I add a perturbation to my magnetic field, for simplicity, sorry. For simplicity, let me uh, choose my perturbation delta B uh, uh, orthogonal to B naught and also delta B much smaller than B naught in magnitude. Okay? So you can think of it with respect to that picture which now I put in the vertical axis because I chose Z to be 
the magnetic field, I am now so, sort of perturbing my field like that. Okay, so I have a small component orthogonal to, uh, to Z. I can choose, for instance, delta B equal to, in components, uh, cosinus minus Kz plus some phase phi, or psi, sorry, sinus minus Kz plus psi, and let me put it to zero along the direction Z. Uh, I want to choose this type of fluctuations in the sense that the motion along X and Y is anyway controlled by the leading term B0, but I want to know what is the first correction to the motion around Z, which is um, uh, um, happening when I add now a fluctuation to this constant magnetic field. Okay, so we will focus on the change of trajectory in the z direction, and we will consider that what x and y is unchanged. Okay? This is a manifestation of something that can be formalized and made more, more um, again, more formal, but for now take it in an intuitive uh, way. So we can compute the, 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 the evolution of the, the pitch angle, or rather the cosine of the pitch angle. This is the ratio of Pz with respect to, to P. Hmm? So it's the cosine of the uh, angle given by the momentum hmm? with respect to the um, constant field. I just write down the, the equation of motion with each choice. One minus mu square over E modulus delta B. And then you have uh, something which is cosinus omega T uh, you will find all this formula uh, in the notes, no, no, no need to really write down everything in detail, minus sinus omega t uh, sinus minus kz plus psi. Hmm? So I can also rewrite this as, by definition, as a constant times something like cosinus, sorry, not omega, let's say W T plus Psi, where I introduce this constant C, which is nothing but Q square root of one minus mu square. Re remember, this is a constant because this is a constant, uh, because mu is a constant, delta P over energy. And W is by definition omega minus mu uh, k, which is the wave number of my perturbation, times v. Okay? So far, so good. Now I can compute, okay? So I have a random wave huh, with an arbitrary phase psi, which I have added, well, not a wave, sorry, a, a fluctuation. This is not propagated. This is all magnetostatic, huh, which I have added. So what happens to the evolution along the z direction, which I express in terms of the evolution of this component pz, or rather pz over p, hmm? mu. Of course, this will be just a statistical description because I have no idea how the field departs from the, uh, for the, from the constant, um, from the constant um, uh, approximation. Hmm? So on average, if I average over, for instance, the phase uh, of these fluctuations, I will get that the average of d mu over dt is equal to zero. Average with respect to the psi. This is trivial. Huh? It's the average of a cosinus. It's, it's, it's basically zero. However, I can, um, I can compute delta mu square in a time t, the variance of this guy, huh? and this is not going to vanish. So this is given by c square integral up to t from whatever, say, zero. I have dt prime dt second of basically cosinus wt prime plus psi cosinus wt second plus psi. Hmm? Now, this product of cosinuses, huh, 
basic trigonometry, I can rewrite in terms of cosinus of the sum and cosinus of the difference. When I average the cosinus of the sum, I still have the random phase, so I get zero. The difference, however, this phase disappears. Hmm? So in that case, when I average over the phase, I won't get zero. There is a finite contribution to the variance of this uh, quantity. Hmm? If you further remember the, the fact that uh, um, basically, um, okay, when you integrate, okay, I can take, let me state first the, the, the result and then I will show you where it comes from. So the derivative with respect to time of this average value of delta mu square, hmm, which means I get rid of one integral, will tend to this result, pi c square delta of w. Hmm? And the reason why, you can prove more formally, but this has to do when, when you integrate over one variable, you get, that, you get a result like sinus, uh, sinus w, Hmm? You get a sinus w uh, t over uh, w. Hmm? Remember that when sinus x over epsilon over x tends to uh, pi delta x when epsilon goes to zero. Okay? So in the limit where I have that uh, delta t is much larger then omega to the minus one, I can use this approximation to re-express the, 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 the primitive of this function and it gives me my result here, okay? So this is an approximation valid when, physically? When you are looking at time scales which are much longer than a generation period, okay? If you look at time scales which are much longer than a generation period, Basically, this variance behaves in a resonant way. Otherwise, this is a finite value which is not a delta. It has a width, okay? So now there are two qualitative considerations that you have to take into account. Uh, first of all, let me rewrite this in more physical units. I can rewrite this as pi one minus mu square times omega times delta b square over b dot not square times what I call k resonant delta k minus k resonant. Huh? I'm just using my explicit definition of w and I'm bringing out in terms of a delta of the wave number. And I have defined this k resonant, which is important, is omega over mu V. Okay, so what is telling me? What is telling me that this evolution along the z direction, this is the only one we are focusing on, once you have fluctuations, deviates from this simple, you know, constant uh, uh, guiding center uh, movement, uniform motion, and it becomes a sort of diffusive evolution. Why diffusive? Well, the first moment vanishes, the, 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 the average, it vanishes, but it has a finite variance. Huh? Not only behaves like in a diffusive way, but it looks resonant in the limit of long time scale. What does it mean uh, physically? Let me draw a picture. Again, this is the moment where the notes will be handy because I cannot draw. So I apologize for my limited skills as a uh, drawer, especially in Florence, everybody seems to be <laughs> so, so skilled. Uh, anyway, so the, the, the picture is the following. Imagine that you have, let me use some color. Um, imagine that you have some um, uh, perturbation, some, some fluctuation of the field. Ah, no, this is really bad. Uh, which one, this one? Uh, then, then you won't have color effects, so it's black and white. So imagine that you have this type of fluctuations, okay? Imagine that you have the Larmor radius, which is very small. 
Hmm? So that the cosmic ray, what does it mean? It means that you won't diffuse along the Z direction, so your cosmic ray will basically surf the wave. You have an opposite uh, regime where the fluctuation is much shorter wavelength than your cosmic ray uh, uh, um, Larmor radius. So imagine a situation like, uh, I don't know, like that, and your cosmic ray is at a larger gyro radius, then along Z it won't diffuse. It will basically, it doesn't really care about the fluctuations. It averages them, okay? And there is a third limit, which is the one that we care about, when basically the, the wavelength of these fluctuations matches the wavelength associated to the, to the, to the gyro radius, huh? to the Larmor radius, which is given by this expression here, basically. This is the link. Huh? You can imagine that, and this is the challenging one, so you, <laughs> you have a fluctuations like that, and you have a Larmor radius which has the same type of uh, 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 scale. In that case, you know, your cosmic rays will be deflected along Z, and this will be corresponding to a diffusion motion along Z. That's the idea. That's what uh, physically means this type of result. Okay? So, um, we have a, this is the heuristic view. We will come back to this problem more formally. Uh, but the idea is that um, the cosmic ray will, in general, diffuse onto uh, fluctuations in the magnetic field which are um, matching its own specific uh, uh, wave number, if you wish. Huh? And uh, in general, it's not like you have a given fluctuation with respect to magnetic field. You have an ensemble of fluctuations. You can decompose, actually, in Fourier uh, uh, um, modes or, in general, through Fourier transform, whatever configuration of magnetic field that you have. And so, depending on how much energy is basically stored in the modes of that wave number matching the Larmor radius of your cosmic ray, the cosmic ray will diffuse more or less. Okay? Notice that this is a diffusion which is qualitatively different from the diffusion you might have studied of a perfume in a room. In that case, sure, the molecules are diffusing, but the diffusion happens through collisions of your molecule with other perfume molecules with the molecules of your, the, 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 the atmosphere, the room, the air in the room. Here, there is no collision. Hmm? It's just an interaction in a, in a classical sense, there is no collision. It's just a, an interaction between the fluctuations of the field and the charged particles. Okay, in a quantum thinking, you can think of these as quasi-particles onto which you are uh, colliding. Huh? But this mode is called, of diffusion is called collisionless diffusion. Hmm? By the way, in plasma physics in the lab, people try to reproduce conditions in which you see this type of phenomena. And these are hard to achieve because you need to, to decrease the density of whatever gas left to such a level that these are the dominant thing. So in, the, in a laboratory plasma, typically you are more in an hybrid situation where both collisional effect and collisionless uh, one uh, matter. So let me just conclude with what happens if you, you know, just write down one formula. What happens once you, um, you have an ensemble of waves, you have an ensemble of fluctuations. Hmm? If you have an ensemble of fluctuations, basically uh, your, your diffusion in uh, uh, pitch angle or mu variable, hmm? Uh, will be, which is also can be expressed in terms of diffusion with respect to the angle itself. Huh? Remember, this angle is the one specified by my momentum with respect to the B field. Huh? Hmm? The regular B field, which is our, our reference. Uh, this is given, essentially, that's the result that we have found here. Forget about prefactors, orders of magnitude. This is just given by one minus mu square times omega. If you have an ensemble, it will be given essentially by delta B square over B naught square evaluated in this resonant 
uh, 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 condition wave number. Okay? The, simplest, the simplest way to look at this result is that the frequency with which your angle is changing, huh? this diffusive time scale, is basically linked to the frequency, the basic frequency huh? that we are introducing. This is the one with which you rotate along your, your magnetic field through a factor which is the ratio of power or energy of your fluctuations with respect to the magnetic field evaluated in this resonant condition. And in general, you will have an ensemble of that. You will have a power spectrum of magnetic fluctuations. Huh? And depending on how this power spectrum is populated as a function of wave number, you will get more or less deflection. Okay? Um, two names that you must be aware of uh, are Kolmogorov and Kragnan. Um, so the, there is no first principle theory for how this turbulence in the magnetic field should look like. Okay? This is still an unsolved problem, even in the hydro case, this is not really a solved problem. According to Feynman, turbulence is the most challenging unsolved problem in classical physics. Um, typically, how does it look, the power spectrum of this magnetic field fluctuation? Um, there are essentially large scales. Hmm? This is K, and this is essentially delta B over B tilde in Fourier space. Hmm? There are large scale K min, which are associated to whatever turbulence you inject in the astrophysical setting. Supernova explodes, motions of gas in the galaxy, and things like that. Kiloparsec, or you know, tens of parsec scales, and so on. And there is a K max at which this turbulence eventually dissipates, heat. Huh? In between, typically, this is a power law spectrum. And this is known as, this is an idealization. Huh? In reality, things are more like maybe that. Huh? But this is known as inertial regime for the fluctuations or for the turbulence. These are just names you might find. Huh? Whenever this behaves like a power spectrum or a self-invariant, scale-invariant type of uh, behavior, this is known as inertial regime. Um, so you parameterize this guy or the spectral energy density of this guy in terms of a power law index. Bec because of this link between delta, uh, the diffusion coefficient and the power, if this is a power law, this is also going to become a power law in terms of omega. And in the notes, you find the analytical link between these two. Okay? In particular, there is a power law index for the spectral energy density where these, or by, uh, better, the spectral energy density associated to the field scales as k to the minus 5 thirds, which is known as Kolmogorov, and leads to a diffusion which scales as rigidity to the minus 1 third. We will come back to that, but just to introduce the names. And then there is another regime that you might find where the density, the spectral energy density of these fluctuations is scaling as k to the minus uh, three halves, and then it leads to a diffusion in pitch angle which is rigidity to minus one half in terms of r. These are just two names, so that if you find in the literature Kraikman or Kolmogorov, you know that what people mean, uh, but I, I don't think I will use them. Uh, but again, uh, be aware about this, these two behaviors which are related to this inertial regime here. So I will stop here, sorry for a few minutes delay, and we will come back to this formalism now will be made more uh, mathematically sound after you are convinced of the basic features of what you should expect. Okay, that's the next lecture. Thank you.